story today, uh, Matthias Bussonnier from UC Berkeley will start out. Uh, then we'll have Suha Sumnap from Oak Ridge National Lab talking uh, in more depth about a use case that he's been involved in for Jupyter Notebooks. And finally, Shreya Kalia from NURSE will be talking about how um, NURSE has deployed Jupyter on their HPC systems. We do want this webinar to be interactive, as it notes there. We, we encourage questions, but because we have so many people on the webinar, um, we would ask people to put those questions either in the chat box in the WebEx tool itself or go to the Google Doc that's uh, noted there with the bit.ly link and list them there. And we will stop periodically uh, and go through those questions that come in. We will make um, the slides and the a recording of, these, uh, of this webinar available in a couple different places, the Exascale Projects archives, these, and so does uh, the Ideas Productivity Project. And you'll receive email when those archives are available in case you want to let some of your friends know about it. Uh, and finally, I would ask you to please um, give us feedback. That last link on the slide uh, is a very short survey that gives you an opportunity to provide feedback about this webinar or the webinar series in general, including other topics that you might like to hear about. And uh, we're very happy to get your input. We would like this to be as useful as possible. Uh, with that said, I will get out of the way and we'll let Matthias start out. Thank you very much, David. Uh, let me see if I can switch to to my side. Okay. Can you see correctly? And do you hear me? Yes, yes. yes we do. Okay. Great. Um, so hi. Um, so I'm Matthias. Um, I'm uh, originally a biophysicist, and I've been a, a core developer of IPython and, 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 and Jupyter since since 2012. Before before it was actually uh, Jupyter. I'm also a co-founder and steering council member. Um, so I know a lot about what what's happening in Jupyter uh, these days, and I'm one of the um, um, older developer uh, here that I spend most time on. Um, on, on Jupyter, and I'm currently a postdoctoral scholar at at, uh, at Builds, and I'm working like my full-time uh, postdoc role is to work on um, on Jupyter. So as David said, this webinar will be in three parts. I will uh, talk for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes with time for questions, and then we have Suhas and uh, Andreas that uh, show two 15 minutes uh, usage. For my part, I will uh, roughly uh, divide the talk in four four parts. Uh, how do we went from IPython to Jupyter? Uh, what is Jupyter? Why is Jupyter popular? And and some Jupyter usage, uh, but um, we have more more information uh, from from the other speaker for that. So everything started um, well uh, almost 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago, uh, where basically Fernando Perez, who uh, wrote IPython during during his PhD. Um, so basically, why did he wrote IPython? Um, he basically had a bunch of Perl make files. Um, C and C++ files and had to, uh, to basically run run a lot of commands to to, to do to do things and uh, discover Python that basically could replace and make the glue between all of that. Except Python didn't have a really good REPL, so REPL is readable print loop, it's a command line interface you use to interact um, with Python uh, um, as a command line. Um, and so he wrote IPython, a couple of hundred line script that was basically having uh, integration with uh, some caching, some prompt numbering, and new plot integration because he was doing a lot of plotting. And IPython grew a lot for uh, for about 10 years until around 2011 when um, the first um, second interface that was basically network enabled as we'll see later uh, appeared. Um, you may know it as the Qt console where basically you had the Qt interface that was able to, to execute Python code, but also display images in line, which is quite convenient for your iterating instead of having floating windows everywhere. And in 2012, the birth of the current notebook, um, if you heard about the Jupyter notebook, we'll describe it what it is uh, a bit later. One thing that you might want to know is that the current notebook, notebook that you're using is actually the six prototype. Um, so there are a lot of failed attempts before that. And basically, we made that Python network enabled, uh, and all of that was made possible in, in around 2012 because the web technologies became mature enough to be able to, to run a powerful app in the browser. Uh, that's, for example, WebSockets, 
that allows uh, servers to push things to clients that were not really available until 2012, and also the rise of uh, JavaScript JIT engines that made JavaScript relatively fast in, in the browser. One year later, around 2013, uh, the core IPython team I was part of at the time uh, sat down with the Julia team. Uh, so Julia is a language from MIT that you may have heard of. And in about a week, uh, we managed to um, update some of the IPython assumptions that the code was Python. And um, the Julia folks uh, wrote a kernel. And so by 2013, the, the IPython notebook at the time was able to not only run Python, but run in Julia. Uh, with the toggle of a checkbox. Around 2014, uh, because a lot of people were complaining, like, why do you have to install IPython to run Julia, or why do you have to run I uh, IPython to run R, we decided to rename part, uh, all of the Python agnostic parts of Ju uh, Jupyter uh, to Jupyter. And now uh, we're in 2018, and there is several million users. Uh, and last week, Jupyter Lab was, uh, was released. That's a, a, a quick story to, to understand how we went from, um, from a simple, a few hundred lines scripts to a multi-million uh, user project. So the question often we have is, what is Jupyter? And it's highly depend on, on the people you talk to. Uh, when you talk to an average user who just started with Jupyter and is not really aware of all the pieces, um, the main thing they, they um, talked about when they say Jupyter is like an event notebook is a highly overloaded term when you uh, go down to the project. Uh, what it mainly is, is a web server and a web app, uh, which is able to load IPYNB files that are in JSON, that contain code, narrative, with math, and results. And you can see an example here on the, on the screenshot with the Lorentz attractor. And you can see that a single document uh, can, um, can have both code, result, and, and narrative. And um, the particularity of this kind of document is that it's attached to a, a remote kernel um, that is doing computation. And the, the process that is doing computation is what in the Jupyter lingua we call we call it kernel. Um, we'll discuss later what a kernel can be. And the other thing that because we are here in the notebook using a, a web a web browser as a as a front end, um, the result you're displaying can be of several types. You can have static results. Like for example, just text, a string that is, um, for example, displayed by print, or we can have interactive um, content, basically completely uh, JavaScript by client side, um, dynamic, um, no, interactive uh, panning and zooming, for example, of graphs. We can have dynamic code, uh, which basically is uh, interactive in the browser, but will be able to call back into the kernel um, to do some computation. So here, for example, in the uh, screenshot, you see sliders, and if you were to move a slider, that would trigger a computation in the, in, in the kernel um, that would solve the learned attractor for different value of the parameters and show the new result back. Uh, Jupyter is highly focused on exploratory programming. IPython was designed for exploratory programming uh, as a REPL uh, and grew popular because of that. And Fernando Perez, who created IPython, uh, coined that in a, in a nice sentence in 2013. In IPython, we have weaponized the tab key, which really expresses how people are using, are using uh, IPython and now Jupyter. Basically, you are trying to, to, to figure out um, a problem, to insight into something. So you will, for example, load data, and then you write in your preference code your object dot, and then you press tab to see all the methods that, that you can call. Then you call this method on, um, on an object um, that returns a result, and this result updates your prior on what you understood from the data, and then you iterate over that. So Jupyter is also uh, an open organization with open governance. Uh, if you've been contributing um, for, for some time, we we'll probably ask you if you want to be part of the governance and try to, to direct where Jupyter is heading. And we are funded by grants and donations, as well as collaboration like Anaconda, who is uh, contributing developer time instead of, of, of money to, um, to the project. So NumFocus is um, a non-profit organization that manages everything uh, for, for us, and we're funded by the, these days, a more uh, Sloan and Hensley, uh, Hensley Foundation. More technically, um, Jupyter is a set of protocol and formats. Um, we reduce the end front end and end back end problem to the end front end plus end back end. 
before Jupyter, when you wanted to execute code in a specific editor or a specific front end, you would have to uh, write a specific plugin for this editor and this language um, to be able to communicate. By having a standard protocol, which is open, free, and relatively simple, basically you just have to um, to, to adapt to this protocol and write this protocol, and then suddenly you have all the other side of the equation free for you. And especially front-end people really want to write back-end code and vice versa, which means that if you are a front-end person who likes something nice, you can just focus on on, on having on, on writing your front-end and you get all your language. And if you're a language geek that doesn't know anything about design or layout, um, you can focus on manipulating bytes for the protocol and then you get all this way of um, of editing uh, live code. And so why do we focus on something relatively uh, simple? Um, and open um, because we are also focused uh, target towards science and interactive use case. We know that most people that are using Jupyter are not computer scientists, and we want something to be relatively easy, easy to write, or for future um, future um, people who replace us to understand what we did. Um, and so we also thought a lot in the document format about science and interactive use case. That's one of the reasons the results are embedded in the document. Um, which is sometimes a critique we, we have, like why is it complex JSON? Um, that, for example, um, help to not have copy past mistakes. If you've already have given talks result from, from experiments, you often have forgotten to update to update the specific figures. And here, by having everything embedded, when you see a result, you're, you're pretty much certain that it comes from the code which is next to it. Um, Jupyter also scale easily both in the uh, um, number of CPUs that you use, um, but also in, in, in time. Like you can you can use Jupyter from education to uh, to HPC, which means you don't have to relearn other tools. And we see more and more um, people using Jupyter early on. So with all of that, we have a really large ecosystem. Uh, everything which is in bold here is developed by the core team, the core team and, and everything which is not in bold is, is community, uh, community maintained. And you see that we have a couple of front ends maintained by the core team. But we have, for example, plugin for Beam, Emacs, Visual Studio Code, Atom Interact, uh, et cetera. Uh, even an iPad app called Juno, so you can literally access HPC from your iPad at home. Uh, we developed kernel. The core team maintained the iPython kernel, but we have a bunch of kernels, and I want to highlight a couple, a couple of them. Especially, you have, for example, a Fortran kernel and a C, C++ kernel, which means that you can run in Jupyter Interactive C and C++ that is able to display um, rich objects. And a number of building blocks. If you really don't like what we're offering, you can rewrite your own, which means that you can completely use Jupyter without um, using any of the things the core team is, um, is actually writing. And so, uh, speaking of front-ends, uh, last week was um, Jupyter Lab release. Um, and so what is Jupyter Lab? It's a new interface, which is completely compatible with uh, all of the other ones, which extends what uh, the current notebook can do um, with a text editor, shell, etc. And the question we have is, is it an IDE? And yes, if by I you mean uh, ID, yes, you mean interactive. The specific feature of Jupyter Lab is that any file format that Jupyter Lab can open, it can be backed by the kernel. So if you open a Markdown file or a PY file or anything else, you can use select uh, with an option and say attach that to a Python kernel and a Julia kernel and then run code directly in this document. On the questions on the documents we see here. I heard that Jupyter Lab is gonna release version uh, 1.0. Um, it seems that Jupyter Lab and Jupyter are going to converge to one. So Jupyter is, uh, as I said, a, a large, um, a large project, mostly protocol and everything. Um, there is Jupyter Lab, which will be the official um, way of running notebooks that we offer. We still have the classic notebook that you've um, that you're all using. The classic notebook will be um, retiring in a couple of years. We'll maintain both for a certain, a certain amount of time. But so far, everything that you can do with a classic notebook, you can do with Jupyter Lab. And as Jupyter Lab is a much more sane um, code base, uh, it's going to be easier to extend and probably will get more features and more stability than what the classic notebook um, 
offers. And it's ready now if you want to use it. The internal API may still change a bit, um, but we, you're, you're, you're free to, to, to start installing it uh, and, and, um, and use it. So popularity, if we look at the Google Trends uh, for a search of Jupyter and Jupyter Notebook, and look at the number of um, notebooks that, uh, that are on GitHub uh, that we try to, to estimate, uh, we see that there's been an, an exponential growth since 2000, 2014 when, when we decided to rename part of, um, of the project to, to Jupyter. So why that? Uh, we think that one of the reasons uh, is that um, we based a lot of our decision on interactivity, because coding is not the end goal of most of our users. Um, they often just want to get insight into something. Uh, they're not um, always always proficient in coding, and a sim sim simple single tool uh, with a friendly interface really helps, especially if you're new to, to computing. Uh, when you tell someone to, that they need to learn how to use SSH key, SSH processor, and submit things, they get scared. The fact that you have a persisting kernel state uh, that allows you uh, allow to iterate on a specific part of, of your computation. Like if you have to run a large simulation and then make graphs, um, you might not be familiar with how to serialize that on disk and reload them. What you can do is run a lot of computation and then just loop in the notebook um, on, on, on what is interesting for you. And the notebook interface gives a great interactivity in between the REPL and the script. Um, you can iterate on a specific cell really quickly, um, but everything you did before and want to do after is really linear, and so you can edit that relatively easily. Plus, the intermixing with narrative allows you to, to really explain what you're doing with math, if you like math, uh, and you can either explain the code or the result you have, um, which is great, um, great for sharing. Uh, the separation of state of the documents in the front end that you're editing and um, and in the back end uh, where the code is running is also important. It's quite robust to crash. If your code is crashing, you still have a document which is in, um, in your front end and you still have your results that are visible. So you can try to figure out what, what went wrong. This also means that because some state is in the document, um, you can save the document, which is a single JSON file, and send to someone um, and even if you run that on thousands of cores, uh, the end results can be read and viewed by, um, by, by others. You don't have to write the different reports to explain what, you, what you've done. And so also relatively trustworthy because you know when you see some, some graph in a notebook that they're coming from the code which is just next to it. So you don't have copy paste issue between the, uh, between the documents. There are a few of your cons, especially for newcomers. Understanding that the document state and the kernel uh, state are different um, can be challenging. Um, so there is always this question of when do I have to rerun everything, uh, which, which is a bit, um, a, still a bit hard to teach. And of course, the notebook format is not flat text, so it's not always um, as widespread as other formats. Uh, so some people cannot edit the file without installing plugins or installing, installing Jupyter. Um, another reason is the network, the fact that it is network enabled and web based. Um, you, we don't need to forget that usually people get attracted by really good design and fancy colors and nice looking things attract a lot of users. Here is a comment that we got from a user uh, last week when we released JupyterLab. Um, the fact that you can have dynamic library and visualization like D3 in the front end is, is, is really attractive. And you can have um, several users, either novice and power users or users with different expertise working on the same notebook. Which means that, for example, you can have someone who is really good at numerical method writing code, someone else writing visualization. And if you're not native English, uh, for example, you can have someone who is good at prose that will write um, the different narrative. There can be also a relatively seamless transition from, uh, from your local laptop to HPC in a really nice configured environment. You can play with code on your machine with the notebook, and once your notebook is almost ready, you can um, head for the menu and just say, well, restart this computation on the cluster and suddenly um, have um, thousands of cores available for you. 
And in an organization context, if your IT have installed Jupyter Hub, then you can have complete easy installation. So you're just arriving to, to, to a national lab, for example. It hooks into the authentication system. As long as you have a web browser, you can head to the right URL, you enter your credentials, or you have an already logged in. Um, and then you have access to, uh, to a powerful computing, uh, computing environment. So I just want to talk a tiny bit about uh, Jupyter Hub. Uh, Jupyter Hub is our way of having multi-user deployment. Um, so we don't have yet real-time collaboration. It was a plan, but unfortunately, it was going to use Google Drive, a real-time API that was retired last December. So even if it's working, we can't use it. Uh, and one of the large advantage of Jupyter Hub is that each user uh, can get their own process version of configuration. Uh, unlike many other applications, when you deploy an application at IT, um, IT level, uh, you usually we have a single version of the application for everyone. Here it gives a relatively large flexibility. So if you want to have some users with a really specific use case, you just need to tweak that for them. And they can, for example, be on bleeding edge or on a custom patch version without affecting other uh, other users. And one other thing that I want to mention is that uh, Jupyter Hub is not limiting limited to running Jupyter. Um, you can, for example, behind the Jupyter Hub, run R Studio or Open Refine or um, or some uh, some other things um, some other things like that. Um, so just going to take to look at uh, one question or two in the document. Um, so I have a question about Jupyter Lab and CoCalc evolved together and have have them merge. So CoCalc uh, was also known as SageMath Cloud um, and is a for-profit company. We allow people to use Jupyter for whatever they, they like. Um, we are in discussion. We often have feedback from the people from uh, from CoCalc, and we try to integrate as best uh, as best as as we can. But we have um, different different requirements because they have uh, clients, and we try to do things open source. So we don't go at the same same speed. And in Jupyter Lab, is there an option to have Matplotlib pop up in a separate windows within the Jupyter Lab interface um, that probably has to be implemented? You, we're welcome to um, to create a pull request. It might need some update to the protocol. Um, like, uh, Jupyter Lab was just really so ob obviously there are still a lot of, of things that can be done better. The challenge often is that uh, we need to support that from many languages, and so it takes time to really design things um, things the correct way and implement things the correct correct way. Take take a long time. So now let's go into um, into Jupyter for HPC. How can you use Jupyter in HPC? So you could, for example, run batch jobs. Um, you have the possibility to run notebook headless using one of the uh, building blocks we provide, which is called NB Convert. Um, and you can even parameterize notebook, for example, to have reports on different events if, you, if you're um, studying, uh, for example, an astronomy value stars. Uh, and then if you see that a star is behaving weirdly, you can reopen this report and rerun it by changing just the way um, uh, just the pieces that uh, looks look strange, but that's now how no not how most people use use Jupyter on HPC. Basically, what people want is an interactive cluster. Uh, the way you uh, you you do that is um, asking IT to run a hub, then on a logging node or a head node you run a notebook server, and this notebook server can spawn kernels that will do computation either on a head node if you're just playing around, or on a fast queue depending on your um, your setup, and when you really want to do some computations, and you actually restart the kernel and all the workers, for example, Dask or MPI, uh, on your cluster, and suddenly you basically just move from a small computation environment to a really large computation environment, without having to SSH completely check that your um, your environment um, uh, works. And so let's see some example of that. We'll see three, um, LIGO, Pangeo, and CERN Swan. Um, so you've probably seen that a, a year ago, two years ago, um, the LIGO interferometer discovered, um, the, uh, confirmed the existence of, of gravitational, uh, gravitational waves. And so some of the event analysis is done, is done with Jupyter. So they have a notebook that basically allow you to um, to go through to the data and, and fit fit the theory to what have been recorded by um, by the interferometer, 
and this package all of that into a repository. They will provide a subset of the data and put that online. And using a project called Binder, you can uh, for free run that um, uh, on, on Google Cloud. So I'm just going to click here. So that's going to take um, a couple of seconds. And you will directly have um, access to a live a live notebook instance when you can rerun the analysis. Here are two except of the graphs you can see. So if you see the, the white shirt on the second graph, which is blue here, uh, so that's, um, that's energy per frequency domain through, uh, um, through time. And this is basically um, the, uh, the sound of two black holes colliding. And if, if everything was fast enough, no, probably a lot of, you can, you have access to, um, to, to the link here. You can try it by yourself and you can rerun the analysis and literally listen, um, to two black holes colliding and change the parameter of the fit, uh, fit by yourself in a few minutes. And it's a really nice way to show that you actually have access to a trustworthy, um, reproducible uh, artifact of, of detecting gravitational waves. And all of that is both run on really large data, uh, data and small sample that um, can be um, rerun by, um, by anyone with access to a, to a browser. Um, there is also Pangeo, the Pangeo project, um, which is um, on, on, on GitHub. It's an effort on the atmosphere ocean and land climate science um, to have a single set of tools that are readily available um, online, cloud-based in recent technology to, um, to be able to, to, to simply do, um, do science. Um, so it uses really recent technology like DAS, which is heavily developed and Jupyter. Uh, also things like Kubernetes, Google Cloud, and will um, create machine on the fly. Um, I highly recommend reading one of my talking blog posts on pongeodata.github.io. Uh, there is also a video showing uh, showing how you can do that. And here, what you can see in this screenshot is an analysis of the weather uh, temperature, I think, um, on the United States. Uh, so that's on the um, left side. And on the right side, what you can see is uh, the dusk cluster um, working, uh, like the, um, uh, the function run by the dusk cluster through time. And you can see in red at the beginning that the dusk cluster is just initializing and loading data, then doing nothing. And then suddenly, once the user executes something, you have um, hundreds of tasks that get spawned, communicate data to each other, and return the final result, which is a, a map you see on, on the left side. So here you have a perfect map of interactive cluster, which is not only interactive in the sense that you iterate your data, but that the cluster is creating, uh, created um, on the fly when the user uh, login uh, on, on Google Cloud, but you could imagine um, providing that um, and hooking that into, into um, um, another kind of machine. And I wanted also to, to show a tiny bit about CERN SWAN, which is a short platform data analysis for, um, for the CERN. Um, if you have a CERN account, it's directly synced with your home directory and it's zero install. They actually provide a gallery and you basically browse your gallery, find an example that looks great, um, whether it's in C++ or Python. And then you will just click on this visualization and it will fork things for you and allow you to run and this data analysis on, on your specific um, specific data set. Um, uh, and, uh, and then you can you can basically modify and, and get insight into into your your data. Um, it's really impressive that uh, you have on the fly in the browser a C++ um, a REPL to um, to do uh, particle physics. Um, I'm going to, to be out of time, so I'm going to that if you want to learn more, we have JupyterCon at the end of August. We still, you still have a few days to make a proposal, and I'm going to uh, read a few questions maybe while we are um, changing speakers. So I'm going to stop sharing, if I figure out how to do that, and answer a question. I'm going to, we now have uh, Suha, I think, that will uh, take the next talk. And, um, have you considered using some of the spider feature in Jupyter Lab? Um, well, yes, but it needs to be implemented. It's like the same question before. It takes quite quite some time to to implement. I am an author maintainer of the Coarray Fortran kernel. Are there API changes that would require kernel maintainers to update their kernels that currently run kernel book to allow them to run in Jupyter Lab? So no, you don't need to change anything. 
thing. Jupyter Lab does not change the protocol. Jupyter Lab does not change the format. Jupyter Lab is just a nicer interface. Um, we we strive to have the, to have the protocol and the format as stable as possible. And if we change format, you will get um, notified relatively early, and we will provide mechanisms to automatically adapt for other can, uh, other frontend or other kernels from one version of the protocol to another. Uh, so you don't need to change anything. Uh, if you are missing some things because you think that there are something in the protocol that, um, that you need, feel free to send this um, this to us. And uh, we will at some point, maybe not this year, but next year, start to think about updates to the protocol uh, and really clearly think about how we want to move things forward. Um, you mentioned in the slide that Jupyter could be run interactively on the cluster. Could you send a link to the corresponding documentation? Uh, the problem is that the documentation is, is a bit everywhere because there are really a lot of move, moving pieces. Um, there is not a single documentation on how to do that because there are many ways of doing it. Uh, but we are going to have a meeting to talk with uh, about some of that uh, with, with Shreyas. Uh, I don't know when, but we can try to, to loop you in if you uh, put your email in the document. And I think that's it for questions. Thank you very much. Shreyas, do you want to go ahead and start projecting your screen? I think that's Suhas on next. Uh, oh, is it Suhas? I'm sorry. Oh, can everybody hear me now? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. So, hi, everyone. This is Suhas Somnath. Um, I'll be talking to you about one of the examples similar to the ones that uh, Matthias talked about. Um, this is specifically going to be about how Jupyter has been instrumental in transforming both the in-house as well as uh, the support for and training for external users who come to the Institute for Functional Imaging of Materials, where I was a postdoctoral researcher until last uh, June of last year. So uh, the concept of the feedback loop between serious simulations and experiments has been elusive for many fields. Uh, numerical simulations, as you probably are all uh, familiar, are very popular on the big computing machines. However, uh, while they're not at the same scale just yet, uh, as simulations, uh, analysis, processing, and visualization on experimental and observational science data is also growing quite rapidly. There are a handful of observational science um, uh, research groups, such as uh, you know the neutron facility that we have here at the SNS, uh, the SNS at uh, ORNL, uh, the nuclear sciences, the bioinformatics, etc., uh, that have been uh, generating vast amounts of data and are currently using um, the leadership facilities. Um, for their uh, um, processing or understanding of, of the data. So uh, now most of the remaining observational science groups might acknowledge the urgent need for the desire to get into big data and analytics, but may, not, may find it challenging to go from uh, uh, the signals that you get from instruments to the data that can be explored at scale on something interactive like, uh, like Jupyter on HPC, for example. Um, I'm going to take this specific example of the materials imaging community and show you that uh, how uh, even such um, relatively new and small fields can generate enough information-rich structured observational data uh, that can go hand-in-hand -hand with the simulation data to complete the uh, feedback loop. And uh, also, obviously, I'll be talking to you about uh, the important role that Jupiter, Jupiter has played in the transformation of this institute. So in order to show you how uh, Jupyter, uh, supported by a domain-specific Python package that we developed, has changed uh, research at this institute, let me provide you a glimpse of the state of the of microscopy before uh, I began work in this institute. Uh, many of these observations are still true of uh, many more scientific domains in general. And um, let me start off by saying that as with any experimental facility, this institute has um, numerous microscopes. Uh, of different kinds, of uh, which gen generate data of different sizes, uh, different, different dimensionalities, going all the way from 2D images to 7D spectroscopic matrices, 
and um, each capable of uh, different kinds of modalities of acquiring information from the samples and uh, resulting in different kinds of data. One of the first observations that uh, I made when I was there was that uh, data size in the observational sciences have recently exploded and are growing very rapidly regardless of the instrumentation that you pick. So clearly laptops and desktop PCs won't cut it anymore. Uh, following the desire to understand more about the materials, we often want to correlate data from in, coming from uh, multiple instruments and modalities. And this becomes another challenge because each experimental mode and each instrument generates custom data or, cust or data in a custom file format which is challenging to open up and explore. Uh, what's more is that the software provided the instrument is almost always simply incapable of doing the necessary analysis or visualization that's often necessary to generate the next uh, you know, a giant leap in science. Consequently, the analysis software for each of these uh, modalities and instruments uh, was being developed and separately by each group of people. And people were rewriting pretty much the same filtering or processing algorithms or analysis algorithms. And, uh, and uh, they, these are not being shared. And when people do share the analysis code, what we were noticing was that people ended up doing so by um, emailing each of the snippets of code, which is far from ideal. And furthermore, there was a giant monolithic MATLAB GUI that was built specifically for user support. Now, I'll get to why that was not the ideal solution. Um, furthermore, even when somebody sends you some code, you may not be able to run it because you have an older version of MATLAB or you didn't pay for getting the MATLAB license. And you know these licenses are getting extremely expensive. Finally and importantly, DOE obviously, um, for, for DOE, neither the data nor analysis software was uh, shared. When, um, when reporting uh, in, in a recent publication. And um, as a consequence, there was no guarantee that could be given for reproducibility. And this is a major problem if you're going to uh, go forward in this era of open science. Clearly, the, there is a urgent need, need for a paradigm shift in the way one needs to think about data, software, reproducibility, the dissemination of knowledge that you acquire after completing a set of experiments. Um, so at this point, I guess I can take some questions and maybe I can stop our latest slide. Um, but if there aren't any, I'm gonna go ahead um, with uh, the fact that, um, so our goal was to eliminate any compromises in science due to the complication in the, the volumes of uh, the data format and uh, the program in data analysis, the high performance computing, the communication, etc. Everybody wants to go straight from um, the signals from the instrument directly to interactive, uh, interactive data exploration and instantaneous, uh, instantaneous computation. However, to make that dream a reality, we need to start from the basics and you need to fill in the gaps there. Um, one of them is obviously an automated and standardized way to acquired it and one solution that we found was LabVIEW software. Obviously the bigger instrumentation facilities like uh, the Neutron Sci Sciences facility will have, uh, you know, their own custom C++ software. But anyway, this is just an example. And the next step was, and this is very, very important, the development of a standardized data structure and a file format that can represent uh, data that's all the way from 2D kilobyte sized uh, images to terabyte sized 7D hyperspectral matrices. And then obviously there's the need for uh, the common sense way of developing software as a community, which is a centralized hub or a repository, uh, which is gonna hold all the um, analysis and pre-processing routines. And finally, after all that, we can think about scaling to HPC and um, having the data to, at the point where it's ready for interactive visualization using something like Jupyter. So um, as I mentioned, um, we developed this um, custom and um, centralized software repository. And this one was called uh, Pycroscopy. It was meant specifically for the scanning probe microscopy community. And um, it was built in such a way that it was, it could be, it was built, maintained and extended entirely by domain scientists. We chose Python because it's easy to, uh, to use um, while having access to all these obscure libraries that you need to open uh, files or analyze uh, materials, uh, you know, data sciences or something. Um, so uh, like I said, we, uh, it used the, um, uh, we used a standardized uh, data format, uh, which regardless of which instrumentation you came from, uh, you, could, you could speak the same language of data. And then obviously if you had a standardized way of representing your data, you could write one version of your filtering and your fitting algorithms and your uh, decomposition clustering, what have you. 
and uh, finally the other the, the the final part of this package um, was what I'll be talking to you more about in detail, which is how we convey information, how we disseminate knowledge that we acquire, uh, how each user disseminates knowledge after they come to the user facility, which is through the process of these interactive Jupyter notebooks. So um, as I mentioned to you before, um, the, the facility where I worked, um, the software situation was such that uh, people were passing around scripts, as well as there was this uh, uh, custom uh, complicated uh, you know, huge monolithic MATLAB GUI that was being given to users, and um, it, it required a software engineer uh, for about three years uh, to write the software. Obviously, it was not at all customizable, and um, every time a user came into the facility, they would not only require hours of instrument training to use the instruments and grab the measurements by themselves, but also they would require two to three hours of training of the software before they start analyzing uh, their own uh, data. And what's more, it was all written in MATLAB because that's what uh, they thought was ideal in those days. And uh, as a consequence of the uh, expensive uh, licenses, they were only deployed on two workstations. So people literally had to stand in queue in a queue to analyze the data. And um, if you extrapolated how that would have gone, the, the, the situation would have been you either buy more workstations and, uh, and deploy the software there or keep it on the same offline desktops. So um, starting from 2016 when this microscopy package was developed and these Jupyter notebooks were developed on top of that, all of this transformed. So this complicated MATLAB GUI became a set of simple Jupyter notebooks that were written by the material scientists themselves and that could be customized if necessary for each user. And um, uh, after these things were uh, um, deployed, the instructions were only given for operating the instrument and uh, there was no training time uh, that was, uh, we, the users didn't require any training for using these notebooks because they're so self-explanatory. And uh, uh, right now, uh, they don't have to stand in, in a queue to analyze the data. They're all getting their own VMs, which are reasonably powerful um, with all the Jupyter notebooks preloaded on the server so they can just go ahead and analyze the data. And um, while uh, in the previous case, nothing would have happened uh, beyond those uh, offline desktops, uh, this institute is in the process of exploring uh, Jupyter Hub, um, transitioning to Jupyter Hub, so the users don't even have to install the software on their own laptops. So the other place where Jupyter has truly, truly transformed um, science, at least in that specific domain, is that um, as of 2017, we are aiming, for, they were aiming for publishing all new scientific journal papers with uh, uh, to be accompanied with a Jupyter notebook. Uh, there's one right here on the right, um, along with the data itself that was acquired. So you have uh, data all the way from the, uh, the the raw measurement that is acquired from the instrument, all the way to the specific figures that were plotted um, or generated for the uh, the paper that that's shown right here on the left. And um, this combination of this Python package and Jupyter has allowed us to disseminate uh, knowledge that we acquired from uh, numerous projects, and this is just a um, a selection of some of them, and we've made uh, tremendous advancements in being able to convey the information a lot more easily, and um, our users are substantially happier because of the fact that um, even though the, the, this is a notebook, the, these are um, these are interactive notebooks, so what they get are, are those nice um, widgets that they can use to um, slice and dice their multidimensional data and explore the data to their heart's content. So with this, I hope I've conveyed that um, with the, if you think through this properly, you can indeed complete this discovery paradigm of, uh, uh, of uh, the feedback loop between simulation and observation, um, so long as you have um, you know, well-structured data and, and a software package that is there to back it up. And um, so I specifically talked about uh, one institute, which was the Institute for Functional Imaging of Materials, which focused on scanning probe microscopy. Um, I can see um, other. You know, I, can, I can see the same paradigm being applied to other institutes in the lab and beyond. And uh, Shreyas is going to be talking a little bit about this. But essentially, um, each community would have their own uh, package of uh, of choice that they would write in their own language. And um, you could have Jupyter Hub deployed on some sort of a, uh, a cloud. And here, in this case, we're using the compute and uh, data environment for science. Um, which is the case, and uh, for Jupyter Hub deployed there, one could essentially service users and also in-house research and um, run these um, 
big computational jobs, like Matthias said, on um, the big leadership uh, class computing facilities. And the OLCF is making progress in this regard, and uh, these are being explored. Um, but Shreyas will be talking a little bit more about um, this in the subsequent talk. But this, I'd like to thank the teams that have been um, instrumental in um, making all of this possible. With this, I'd like to take any questions that you might have. So, um, okay. Um, the question about uh, oh, has there been a discussion? Yes, of course. Certainly. Just give me a second. Um, I'm still sharing the screen. Okay. Stop sharing. All right. There you go. All right, so uh, while Shreyas gets up, I'm just going to answer the handful of papers. Um, a handful, handful of questions that we have here. Has there been any discussion about DOIs for notebooks? Uh, good question. Um, the, we're, we're actually packaging up the um, we're a single DOI for the data and the notebooks for right now. We haven't specifically talked about having DOIs for the notebooks alone. Uh, as far as experimental data is concerned, you would you would need both in order for something to make sense. So uh, potentially, if you did not require any data, or if you're not doing any analytics on your data, then I suppose you could uh, certainly have a DOI for a paper book. Um, who's, pub who's pushing all paper seven notebooks? Yes, this is, um, this is specifically the culture that's being set up in that particular institute. Um, DOE is encouraging people to do this, to have for all papers to have to be essentially the science to be reproducible, and this is one way we think that um, we can accomplish this. So, in that particular institute that I talked about, that this is the um, um, this is the paradigm that picking. Um, this case have Jupyter Hub deployed already. Um, yes, it does have Jupyter Hub deployed for a very specific group. Uh, there's a uh, gentleman named Damien who's who's worked on this. Um, any cluster teams that already have Jupyter deployed for the fully at the center? I'm not entirely sure I can answer this uh, at the moment. Maybe I'll, I'll think about it and answer this at a later point. All right, I guess, Shreyas. Um, yep. So I think that maybe that last answer is. Yes. My, uh, well, I guess what I'm, I'm going to be talking about our Jupyter Hub deployment at NERSC is the short version of this talk. So um, maybe that's that's that answers part of that last question. Um, so you guys can see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm uh, Shreyas Cholia, and along with Roland Thomas and Shane Cannon, we've been working on a Jupyter Hub deployment at NERSC, and this talk is primarily about that. Um, so most of you are probably at least somewhat familiar with NERSC, given the, uh, the community, but um, we do have the, the Cori system. This slide might be a little bit old, but the, the point here is that we're trying to sort of set up this paradigm where Quarry has both a um, HPC partition, which has KNL nodes, but also a data partition, which is focused on data-centric workloads and supports things like real-time queue, shifter, Jupyter, burst buffer, among other things. Um, so, you know, we're really kind of looking at data users as first-class citizens on the Quarry system. Um, and as I talked about, you know, Jupyter is sort of an important part of this strategy. And part of where this fits in, I mean, this is maybe somewhat of a um, repeat of some of the stuff Matthias and Silas already talked about, but the idea is that Jupyter Notebooks give you these kind of literate computing narratives where you have code and comments. Um, you can reproduce your science, you can show your work, document your workflow, but then you can also have rich text and interactive plots and widgets all in there which allows for this iterative um, exploration to arrive at insights. Um, the other side of this is that Python also has a pretty central role at NERSC. And um, when we did our last survey, I think Python was by far the most popular language at NERSC. Um, not even necessarily for the, as the code that runs the backend simulations, but some projects are using it for HPC. But a lot of projects, even if they're using other codes in HPC, they're actually wrapping some of this stuff in Python to script up their workflows or to perform the exploratory analyses before and after. And so 
this kind of led us to Jupyter and, and wanting to have something where we can deploy Python in a standard way for everyone. Um, and, and Jupyter Hub kind of became the thing that we used to deploy that. So users running their own, we noticed that users were just starting to run their own notebook servers on our systems, um, which means that people are basically running a web service on there and it started to make some of our security people uncomfortable. Um, plus people were having their own environments, their own kernels, so you know, dealing with tickets there was a, its own challenge. So Jupyter Hub became a way to centralize the deployment of notebooks at NERSC in a standard authenticated manner and we could package up some standard kernels through Anaconda um, and, and crucially it gave people access to things like you know the underlying file systems or the batch queue or the network or the databases. Um, so as Matthias mentioned earlier, Jupyter Hub is really you know, Jupyter as a service and it is a service you can use to deploy notebooks on the cloud. Um, and so, so, or notebooks on a, on a cluster. So the, the Jupyter Hub service manages user authentication, notebook deployment, web proxying, and then what it does under the covers is fires off a notebook per user. So the user logs in with their NERSC username and password, and they get their own notebook on um, a Cori login node. So to kind of give people a sense for how we got here, um, the first sort of requirement we wanted to deal with was just giving people access to data at NERSC and then having them be able to do what, what they need to do. Um, so in this model, we basically had a Docker container that ran this Jupyter Hub web service um, and it had the global file system mounted on there and people would log in and get this notebook server processed and they had access to the file system and mostly this was for pre and post processing but almost immediately it became very popular. OpenMSI, Lux, Metabolite Atlas, a bunch of projects started using this. Um, the, however, there were some key things that were missing in this deployment. Uh, among other things, the Luster Scratch file system was not accessible here um, and we didn't have access to the batch queues or the you know, the same Python environment as Cori because this was its own little Docker container that things were running under. So step two was figuring out how to integrate this with, um, with the Cori uh, system. And so what we ended up doing is deploying Jupyter Hub as a web server that lives outside of Cori, but it's then going out and spinning up these notebook server processes inside of a set of special purpose Cori login nodes. Um, so these are big memory nodes that we deployed with the express purpose of running Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so, you know, they have, I think, 700 plus um, gigabytes of memory, um, you know, lots of processors. But because it's on, you know, it's the equivalent of a login node, you basically also have access to things like the file system and the batch queue. Um, and you have the same Python environment that you're running on, on the compute side. And so this gets a lot closer to what people actually want. And so that's what we have in production right now. In order to make this work, we had to write a couple of packages to make everything happen smoothly. So we wrote this thing called the GSI Authenticator, which basically lets you log in and grabs, under the covers, it grabs an X509 certificate for you that lets you, you know, manage the GSI SSH connection to the Cori node from within the hub. Um, we also wrote this thing called SSH Spawner, which lets Jupyter Hub fire up SSH connections and uses the SSH connection to talk to the notebook itself. Um, and it keeps track of the PID there. So this is just sort of a longer version of what I just said. The key thing here is that, you know, having this authenticator means that we can instead of requiring privileged access, all you're doing is getting these certificates and using that to manage it. Um, so no root access is actually required to this setup. Um, and then with the SSH spawner, um, you can actually use these X509 certificates to go and talk to um, the, the, the backend service. Now, the SSH spawner will also let you use SSH keys if that's a preferable way of doing it. So any kind of, um, you know, secure token that you want, you can sort of use with this SSH spotter. Um, so there's a question here, what is the NERSC deployment doing about 
internal encryption. Um, so we're just using things out of the box right now. Um, keep in mind, yeah, so, so the notebook and the kernel are running on the same node. And so it's less of an issue, but yeah, as soon as we start, we split up the notebook and the kernel, which is something we're looking at doing in the future, that is a problem that we're gonna have to solve. Um, but, but as of now, it's, 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 it's within the same node, and so we're just using the default zero MQ transport. So, um, but, but yes, we do recognize that, that is an open problem. Um, so we also deployed this thing called the slurm magic, which um, lets you, basically gives, gives you sort of hooks into the batch queue. So IPython slash Jupyter has this notion of a percent command. So instead of the native language command, you can type this in and you can actually use this to submit jobs, to look at the queue, to look at, you know, see what's running. So it's a quick way of just submitting jobs from within the notebook um, to the Slurm batch system. And we also gave people the ability to write their own custom kernels. So if they didn't want to use our default Anaconda software, they could do their own kernel. So we, this is mostly just a matter of, you know, using the existing hooks in Jupyter and then documenting things to, so people can actually use their own kernels. They just drop a JSON file in their home directory and this, that way they can run their own kernels. Um, moving forward, and since we're running close on time, I'll be a little quicker, but, but the idea here is that we want to move from, you know, this Jupyter Hub web server that then talks to the login node. We want to also be able to spin up processes on the compute node where you've got the notebook server and the kernel on an individual compute node per user. Um, and then moving forward a little bit further, you, you want to maybe move towards splitting up the kernel and have that run on compute nodes and then have the notebook server on its own compute node. Um, we're looking at software-defined networking to make this a little more seamless. So once the hub has everything set up, you can actually advertise an IP out to the world and then directly talk to either the login node or the compute node. So that's you know sort of an interesting way of look, doing things and, and makes things a lot smoother. Um, we've got a LDRD project for doing human in the loop HPC, and this is this idea of having interactive workflows where you have your notebook that can communicate with backend tasks. And this is sort of just a you know, recap of what I talked about, the idea that you have this Jupyter infrastructure that can spin up notebooks and you can spin up kernels on the compute node and use software to find networking to get, get it to work together. Um, we could have different you know, QoSs and Slurm to be able to support these kinds of things and then use something like Docker and Shifter to be able to capture environments. So this is all sort of, you know, the, the stuff we're looking at right now and we hope to have in the next year. And yeah, uh, big thanks to folks at Minnesota Supercomputing Center, TAC, SDSC, the Jupyter Dev team. We've worked with all of them to um, put some of this stuff together. So um, this is by no means our own work. It's, it's sort of a big collab collaborative effort. So yeah. And finally, yeah, this is kind of a direct quote from a user. They want to be able to do everything in the notebook. It's like the ultimate dream for them. All right, thank you. And let me so see. So we do have part. a few questions for you. Yep. Um, so I'm looking at the questions here. The one that I, so there's one about how does data get into the notebook? Um, so the data itself is on the file system. And so you could just load that up directly because the notebook has access to the file system. Um, and then the next thing, does it work with two-factor authentication? So is anyone else having a hard time hearing? I have lost the speaker. Oh, sorry, I'm here. Sorry about okay, that. There you are. Okay, so the question was uh, two-factor authentication, and the answer is yes, it's completely transparent as far as Jupyter is concerned because um, Jupyter just implement the authenticator just falls back on using um, PAM under the covers, and so that's actually implemented at the OS layer. 
So um, it, the, the two-factor part is completely transparent from Jupyter's standpoint. And then the other question was, how does data get into the notebook? And the answer there is it's on the file system at NERSC. And so since the Jupyter notebook has direct access to the file system, you can just load it from there into the notebook. So um, did you see the one about, are there plans to provide access to Edison Scratch from a Jupyter notebook? Um, probably not. We're, cur we're currently focusing on the Cori file system uh, and, and the Cori system. There are a couple of, yeah, so I, th I think the short answer is not immediately, but if there's, if there's enough people asking for it, we can find a way to make it happen through some sort of, we can mount the Edison file system, we can cross mount it if we have enough people asking for that. It would still run on the Cori node, but we might be able to cross mount that file system if there's some demand for that. All right, I think that we have addressed all of the questions in the Google Doc and the chat box. So, um, David, do you want to take it from here? Hey, David. Oh, I can hear you now. Oh, no. Thank you to our speakers and also to everyone who participated today. It's your involvement that keeps us going. We'd very much like to get feedback from you. Once again, the um, link is at the top of the slide. We will make uh, recordings uh, and a copy of the slides available online, so look for some email about that or just go visit either of these links a little bit later on. And then I'd like to mention that the next uh, webinar in the HPC Best Practices series will be on March 21st. The topic is Eclipse for HPC, the Eclipse IDE Integrated Development Environment. Speaker will be Greg Watson from Oak Ridge National Lab. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you next month.